Today, Chess Kid brings you a bit of a weird lesson on YouTube. It is the strangest opening ever used successfully by top grandmasters. What could it be? Well, stick around. Before we get there, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you can make sure that I bring you a lot more fun after this one. Now, how do you answer E4? Fun Master Mike loves to play the modern defense G6. So far, so good. But then after D4, I always play the move bishop to G7. What about knight F6 on the second move? Well, that allows white's snow pie to come forward with E5. And then if you put your knight here, the pawn will come to C4 and those pawns are rolling. So you can actually put your knight on the square H5. Oh, is this a real opening? I mean, I know we've given it a name, the Norwegian defense, but I'm going to call it the oh, because it doesn't look good. Why do we call it the Norwegian defense? Well, I did absolutely zero research on this, except I can say that that guy, Magnus Carlsen, has played it several times in his career, and not just in Blitz. He once played it at the Chess Olympiad, so maybe we named it after him. But you know what? It's not just from his crazy mind. You know who else has used this opening? Several other 2800s. Jan Nepomneshi has actually beaten Vichy Anand with this opening. Richard Rapport has played it, and also Alexander Morozevich has played it. You might not know him, but he used to be 2800, and many of them have used it quite successfully. Pretty weird stuff. Now, what is the big idea? Well, if bishop to e2, which is the most common response, the grandmasters actually value the bishop pair so much that in this position, they always play the move d6. And the funny thing is, if you try to win a pawn over there on the side of the chessboard, you have to give up your bishop pair, and black gets a lot of counterplay in the middle of the board. In fact, if white takes, you're already not winning a pawn over here, because when the queen takes, if you go pawn grabbing over here, bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes, you actually end up losing the center pawn right back, and black is doing just fine, thank you. In fact, I'd prefer black with the extra center pawn and the bishop pair. So that's sort of the tactical idea by black. Let's go back to this position. Black is also hoping that the knight will end up being able to come closer to the center later in the game. Now, in practice, this knight often ends up just having to go back to the square f6, and we play a pretty reasonable game where black has wasted a couple of tempos. So I'm gonna have to say that putting a knight on the edge of the board, it wins in spite of the knight, not because of the knight. Of course, I'm sure you want to see at least one time that Magnus won with this opening, so let's continue for a few more moves, and then we'll also fast forward till the end of the game. And the game we're going to be following is against a guy named Fabiano Caruana. Ever heard of him? Oh yeah, Magnus had trouble beating him in the World Championship. Eventually, he got past him in the tiebreaker, but he actually used this opening to beat Fabi once in a blitz game. So after the move knight c3, Magnus played a6 to stop any knight invasion here. And then after the move bishop to e3, the knight realized, hey, it probably is not going to get to this square, or if it does, then the queen is going to be tied down to defense. So Magnus actually brought the knight back to the square f6. Now, what did Magnus get hmm. for those two knight tempos going to h5 and back? Well, he did clarify the center. He did get rid of the snowplow, and now white is only down to one pawn. We are going to fast forward, and we got into a very exciting position later on with the king's castle on opposite sides. So, jumping ahead 17 moves. Bang, we get to this position. And it looks like Magnus is going to get his pawn storm going. But you know what? If he pushes a pawn b4 here to attack the knight, this knight will actually go to the edge of the board and serve as a pretty decent blockader against the A-file ever being able to open up. So instead, after this position, Magnus decided that he had studied king level 53. Well, actually, he probably taught king level 53. And he played the exchange sacrifice. Rook takes c3, which is totally a valid move here. It breaks up white's king's castle. And also, after takes, this knight hops into the square d5. And you can see those knights are dancing. Just a few more moves. After bishop d4, I'm going to show you how this knight ends up becoming the star. And we're going to fast forward to this position. You can see the knight is already awesome. White decides to save the rook. Magnus jumps in with the queen. And now I just wanted to show you this one tactic. This knight is better than either of the white rooks. And here Magnus played the really nice move. Knight takes a two. And he went on to win the game because there's no more protection around the white king. And of course, the king cannot capture because now rook takes. And in fact, it's a horrible two rooks oh, no. against queen position because when you move the king, let's just say you go back, 
I'm gonna take your queen, oh. and then when you take back, my queen is already rolling, capturing several pawns. I've got these two passers coming down the board, and it's an easy win for black if this had transpired in the game. Am I telling you to play the Norwegian? Uh, I don't think I am. I even think this is called the Norwegian rat in some places. Ugh, do you wanna play an opening like that? Not really, but it is kind of fun to see what happens when the world champion and other strong players let their hair down. Every once in a while, a crazy opening like this will work.